Hi everybody, thanks for joining us. Uh, if you're new to the group or just missed a session, this is a great way to kind of catch up on what we've learned, what we've been talking about the last couple weeks. Uh, first things first, we have a Facebook group. It's called Ram Youth, Red Arrow Ministries Youth. Please join that page. We'll uh, let you stay connected with all the stuff that's going on at Red Arrow and um, love to have you there. We're in our series on identity. This is week three, and I'll do my best to get up parts one and two, too, so if you've missed all of them, you can kind of check in and see. But we're in the book of Ephesians, talking about our true identity in Christ. So this week we're talking about uh, made alive. And as is true of every week, we have kind of some obscured images here. And... Um, so just take some time and, and try to decipher what that thing is. It's something that you're probably familiar with. What do you think it is? Guesses? And if you've played along last night, you already know. Maybe that helps. A Reese's bar. All right, good job. I don't know if you're playing along or whatever, but it's a Reese's. Sweet. I love Reese's. What about this thing? Last night we had guesses such as a mountain, a hat. What about that? It's the Adidas logo. All right. Cool. Good job. You're two for two. Or 0 for two. I don't know. What about this? Make it a little clearer. It looks like a girl of some sort. Ah, it's Selena Gomez. All right. The weeks previous, we had Justin Bieber and One Direction. So this is something for the guys. And uh, just on record, one of the students thought that Justin Bieber was Jesus. So don't know what to say about that, but it's all good. It's all good, right? What about this thing? A lot of people said Mario. Kind of looks like Mario. Uh, could be Mario with a cape or Superman. Superman, all right. So these little games always serve a purpose. Um, just like the images on the screen are a little bit obscured, there's, there's pixels, they're pixelated, they're kind of difficult to decipher what they are, sometimes that's the same case with our identity. And this series aims to really see what our identity is uh, in Christ. Okay, so if we're, if we're talking about who we are, it's proper to understand what Jesus says about us and to us. So this is kind of a thesis of this entire series, um, this is kind of the building blocks of, of why we're doing what we're doing. If we move on, last week we talked about in Christ we are adopted, and in Christ we're redeemed. And, and in short, adoption is simply becoming part of the family of God. We once were not a part of God's family. And in Christ, because of the, sac the uh, sacrificial work of Christ on the cross, we are adopted into his family, part of the family of God. We're loved as his children. And the second point there, in Christ we're redeemed. Redemption we talked about. Um, when you go to an arcade, you play video games, right? And whatever that is, is Mortal Kombat. Maybe it's skee ball or maybe it's shooting a basketball. Whatever game you're playing at the arcade, you hope that you get tickets out of it, right? You usually walk around and see what game has the biggest jackpot, and you kind of play the game with the biggest ticket amount. And when you win the tickets, uh, it'd be silly for us to just take the tickets home and say, hey, Mom, look what I got, look all these tickets. But the point of the tickets is actually to go buy a prize, right, to go to the redemption table and to redeem those tickets for something uh, that's worthwhile. So maybe that's a big... Uh, stuffed animal figure, maybe it's a, a whoopee cushion. I love whoopee cushions. I don't know if they still exist. but Or maybe it's like bouncy balls. I know my brother and I used to get bouncy balls, and they were cheap, and we used to collect a whole bunch of them. Whatever it is, we're redeemed by Christ. Christ paid his life to buy us back. So this week we're in Ephesians 2, and there's a lot here, um, and we're not ignoring the part in the gray um, we're just going to be mainly focusing on the stuff in the white. So I'll read it out loud and then we'll kind of dissect a little bit of it. This is Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 out of the ESV. 
And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom, whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. So we read this passage, this probably isn't something you find on, the, on a coffee cup, right? I mean, you typically find like Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You know, or maybe you'll see uh, Psalm 100, where um, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for the, the Lord is with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You're probably not going to see Ephesians 2 on it. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. I mean, you wake up with a cup of coffee. That's probably not the first thing you want to remember in the morning, right? Yet, this is what Paul, the apostle that wrote this to the church at Ephesians, this is what he wanted to communicate to the people. Um, we looked about this last night, trespasses and sins. And I asked, I asked the audience, what was a trespass or a sin? And we got uh, stuff, different answers from, from different folks. Uh, a lot of them kind of hit the nail on the head when they said maybe going somewhere you're not supposed to go, doing something that you're not supposed to do. And this is exactly what I was hoping for, because we've all seen signs like this. Posted signs on fences that... Uh, declare that going beyond this point is doing something that you probably shouldn't do. I don't know what's on the other side of that fence, possibly a construction zone. Maybe uh, the people who put this sign up knew that people that trespass over there would cause themselves great harm or danger if they were to go over there. You know, maybe they get whacked in the head by a falling boulder or flying sledgehammer. I don't know if sledgehammers fly, but someone had to throw, uh, whatever. Furthermore, Trespassing, you know, do not walk here. These are all signs that you're probably familiar with. My, my favorite was this one. Private property, no trespassing. We don't call 911. We'll shoot you and we're not calling the cops because you're walking on our... I don't know if that's biblical or whatever, but it's kind of funny. So all this to say, trespass is simply going where you shouldn't go. Right? So God has a set of rules, and if, if you guys are at church at Red Arrow, Ben's going through a series right now on the Ten Commandments, right? And, and these commandments are not to restrict us of having fun, but they're to protect us and to allow us to walk in the fullness of what God would have for us, uh, spiritually speaking. So if, we, if we've decided that trespass is going somewhere where we shouldn't go, who's guilty? And you can't see me right now, but I'm raising my hand. I'm raising my hand. I am the first one to be guilty of doing this, of doing things against what God has commanded me to do. And Paul would say, yep, I'm in the same boat. Those purple words, Paul clearly says, you did it, in which you once walked. And then if you feel like Paul's pointing the finger, read verse 3, and he says, among whom we all once lived. So Paul is, is identifying himself of doing the same things that you and I have done. We've done stuff that we're not supposed to do, and we haven't done stuff that God uh, maybe would have us do. I, I think of the times that I sense God leading me to do something, perhaps go across the street and introduce myself to my neighbors, um, and I, I don't do that. That's equally as much of a sin or a trespass as not doing something or as doing something bad. I hope that wasn't confusing. Uh, but there's multiple ways in which we've not hit the mark of which God has called us to be, the people God has called us to be. So we're going to take a little example. This little girl right here, her mom just made fresh cookies. right? Fresh cookies straight out the oven. I mean, you can still smell the aroma in the air. You're salivating right now, right? And so is she. So her mom put the cookies in the cookie jar and told her, no cookies before dinner. But that little girl disobeyed her mom. She stole a cookie. And mom is freaking out. Mom is wigging out hardcore right now. I told you not to take that cookie. And she did it anyways. 
So, I know it's not a crime, but just for the sake of this illustration, we'll call it a crime. Stealing a cookie. And mom told her not to. Mom is the authority figure here. And, you know, all crimes should result in punishment. And maybe she sentenced this little girl, or in this case, a little boy. He's feeling tremendous shame for what he's done. You know, he, he doesn't know if he can go on living anymore after stealing the cookie and mom yelling at him. Because he's in timeout. Maybe timeout for you is not going on Facebook. Maybe that's what your mom or dad has said. That's, it. that's your punishment. You no know more Facebook for the rest of the day. Maybe they take your phone away. No phone for the rest of the day. I don't know what it is for you, but a punishment usually fits the crime, right? So we'll, we'll take it one step further. This dude right here looks like he just robbed a bank. So he's got a couple G's in his hand there. He's got a keyboard. I don't know where the computer monitor went. He probably already put that in his car or his getaway white van. That's probably what he's driving because that's what all robbers drive, right? I don't know. But the crime he's guilty of is theft. He stole money. He stole a keyboard. He committed a crime. But this time, the authority that he's rebelled against is not mom. It's the cops, right? It's the law. And the punishment for the crime he committed, being, being uh, arrested by the law, is prison. To some degree, he deserves prison. And, and I think we'd all agree that if someone kills another person, it'd be a really bad thing, it'd be a really unjust thing for that person to be on the streets still. It's a good thing that people like that are behind bars. See, the law in this case is not to restrict us from fun, but it's to keep people that inflict harm on others, keep them in a, in a place where they're not going to inflict harm on others. So the punishment fits the crime again. This time we'll take it one step further. And before you email the staff at Red Arrow and say, Brandon is a thief, he should not be the youth director at Red Arrow. Uh, I'm not a thief, I haven't stolen a bunch of money like that. But for, for this scenario, remember that, that I am guilty of this crime. And the crime this time isn't stealing money, but it's actually sin. And remember, I raised my hand when I asked the question of uh, who's guilty of trespasses and sins. I raised my hand. So that's me. I'm guilty of sin. And the authority that I've rebelled against in this case is not the cops. It's much greater than that. The authority this time is God. So the creator of all mankind has given us certain rules and regulations to follow that uh, we would actually thrive under. It, it wouldn't limit our fun, but it'd actually allow us to thrive and live the full life that God intended us to do so. Um, if I sin, I transgress against God, I deserve punishment too. And, and what punishment could possibly fit the crime? Right? A slap on the wrist? Not according to Ephesians 2. What we're in talking about here is that the punishment actually for our sin is death. Or even more severe, wrath. Wrath is a, is a righteous anger, right? Just this heated, furious anger against us. And that's exactly what Paul says here. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. And then the last green words... You're children of wrath. And can we all agree that those are dark words? Right? Dead, children of wrath. No one wants to be on the opposing end of, of that and, and saying that I'm dead, I'm a child of wrath. Like, whoo! You know, and if you, if you remember last week, we talked about being a children of God, you know, being adopted into God's family. And, and now we're talking about children of wrath. And it, and if this is kind of confusing at this point, it, it should be. Um, I'll, I'll touch on it later, but you, you can't be a child of wrath and a child of God. You're either one or the other. But I think it's important for this series to just understand that's what Paul says about us. Okay? Now this guy right here, he's dead. We'd all agree he's dead. He's fallen and he can't get up. And, and last night... I uh, exercised terrible drama in walking across the stage and then tripping. I proceeded to trip. I fell down. Some people thought it was funny. Some people just thought it was terrible acting. It was probably both. 
But I illustrated the point that when I fall, I'm 25 years old, I fell, and um, you know, maybe I have a couple bumps and bruises when I fall, but I pop right back up. You know, there's not really much that limits me from getting back up after I fall. And I asked the students last night, what would happen, though, if your 90-year-old grandma was uh, getting a glass of milk last night and she fell on her way to the refrigerator? What would happen to her? And the response was, well, maybe she'd get back up. It'd probably take her a lot longer to get back up. And um, perhaps she would have to call somebody, right? There's that new life alert button. It's actually been around for a while, but elderly people can wear it on their wrists. And if they do fall... They push the button and then uh, it automatically dial dials 911 or something like that and uh, rescues on the way. So an older person is going to have a lot harder time getting back up than me or even middle schoolers. I mean, middle schoolers pop right back up. I mean, they could break an arm. Their arm's hanging there by a couple threads and like pop it back into place and keep playing, right? I don't know if that's true, but think about the dead guy, though. This dead guy, does he have any hope of getting back up? I would hope the answer would be no. He has no hope of getting back up. And one of the students last night pointed out he doesn't have any hope unless someone gets him back up, right? Someone picks him back up and gets him on his feet, somehow puts new muscles on his bones, somehow puts new flesh on his body, a new heart, new kidneys, new brain, etc., etc., etc. This guy has no hope. This is exactly right. Um, th that guy has no hope in and of himself. Um, this last slide, we're still in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. The blue words I highlighted are kind of the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, they're all in past tense. So we talk about in English, there's different tenses of words, past, present, and future tenses. These are in past tense. And usually that wouldn't be a big deal, but why, it's a really big deal right here. And I think if we understand that these are past tense, Paul, the apostle here, is talking about these things used to be true of you. You used to be dead. Here you are again. Remember this guy? That was true of you. You once walked there. You once lived in the passions of your flesh. But the light at the end of the tunnel is God wasn't content with leaving you that way. The two, two of the, the most influential and often overlooked words in this uh, next section are these two words. But God, you were dead, God wasn't content with that, but God, God did something about it. He was not going to leave you in your dead state. So if we think about these two words, we move on to the following passage, and it says this, verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love in which he loved us, even when we're dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Do you see what's going on here? God is rich in mercy. We deserve wrath, but he's extended to us mercy. Mercy is, is uh, something that we, we get that, that we really don't deserve, right? He has great love. Even when we were dead, absolutely no way to pick ourselves back up, he made us alive together with Christ. Notice, Jesus is the active uh, participant here. We have no hope apart from him. He made us alive together with Christ. It doesn't say that we've become alive in and of ourselves, right? That's not how Paul says this. He says, We're made, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. The big idea for today, last week we had two, the week before we had four big ideas. This week we have one big idea. That who we once were does not define who we are. Who we once were does not define who we are. And to illustrate this, I have a chart. And it, this is what was true and what is true. And, and kind of the dividing line here is whether or not our faith is placed in Jesus for our salvation. Okay? So if the what was true column is true of you, Maybe you haven't put your faith in Christ, and maybe he hasn't given you a new heart, and maybe he hasn't made you alive yet. And what I would just urge you to do is to put your faith in Jesus, to say, I am a sinner, 
God, would you please come into my life and make me new? And, and he'll listen to you. Prayer is just talking to God. But let's go through this. What was true of us was that we were dead. And what is true of us, we, we have been made alive. We just read that in Ephesians 2. Second, what was true is we used to be a prisoner. What is true is that we're now free. What was true is we had a life of purposelessness. I don't even know if that's a word, but it is now. Uh, we had no purpose apart from the grace of God, right? What we learned last week is that we've been chosen on purpose and God has given us a purpose. If we're part of the family of God, we have a purpose. What was true, we used to be a slave, now we're redeemed, remember? We, we talked about, just at the beginning of this lesson, how God has bought us back with his blood, that it cost him his perfect life. We used to be children of wrath, now we're children of God. Remember how I said, you can't be both, right? The truth of the gospel is this. If you're a child of wrath, all of the trespasses that you've committed, the sins that you've committed, they land on you. You're fully responsible to bear the weight of those on judgment day. God will judge um, he, he will sentence us to eternal punishment, and that's scary. And I don't mean to manipulate or scare people. I'm just wanting to deliver the mail truthfully. Now, if you're a child of God, the truth is that Jesus was crushed for you. Okay, so the wrath that you deserved was put on Jesus, and Jesus' goodness and righteousness was given to you. Uh, Martin Luther, one of the smart guys of the Reformation, said that that very truth right there is the great exchange. That Jesus took your sin upon himself and Jesus gave you his perfect life for free. But just because it was free doesn't mean it didn't cost him something precious. So that's the truth. You can't be a child of wrath and a child of God. You're either one or the other. What was true is we used to be cursed and now we're blessed. And the big idea of this series on identity is what was true, your identity used to be in yourself. Anything you could produce, what you did, what you didn't do, what groups you were a part of, uh, what talents you had, maybe um, what you had or didn't have. What is true is that our identity is in Christ. So it's of utmost importance that we don't just simply know these truths, but each individual has a responsibility to respond. If God is trying to make you alive, if you sense that God is tugging on your heartstrings at this moment, I just want to encourage you just to say a simple prayer. And like I said earlier, prayer is just talking to God. Tell Him, God, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. Would you come into my life? Would you make me new and give me the life that I can live um, in complete surrender to you. So just to finish it all out, there's a few questions. And as we ponder these things, I hope it's my desire that we see the bad news of our sin, but we, we fall more in love with Jesus hearing the good news of our salvation. Thanks for joining us today, and I hope to see you guys next week. I think we're going to head on to Harvest Moon Acres and do a corn maze, so it should be fun. Invite your friends. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.